to hear a lot about that. You actually see people talking about um, uh, butter is back and we should be not avoiding saturated fat because it's healthy for you. It raises your HDL or, you know, the, the interesting things that people say uh, that don't quite fit all the evidence. And when you look at the totality of the evidence, it's very clear that the more saturated fat you do, the more mortality you have. And so I know we have a fair number of uh, vegan diets that say no oils. Well, that, it, and you know, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I've heard that so many times. I'm sure that, that, that there's a lot of truth to that. Um, but the data on mortality says that uh, more monounsaturated fat, more polyunsaturated would actually decrease mortality in a step in a dose related fashion. Now, if you say that that's not in the vegan population, that's probably true. And if you say that it's a substitutionary benefit, <clears throat> meaning that when you're replacing saturated fat with monounsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fat, that's what's causing the decrease in mortality. And that is probably true as well. So every time you, you uh, replace one with the other, getting rid of saturated fat, for every 5%, you're decreasing the mortality by 27%. Now, um, one of the studies that sort of called into a question whether or not vegetarian diets were really good uh, was the PURE trial saying that, um, you know, vegetarians were eating too many carbohydrates and carbohydrates increase mortality. The interesting part of that is what they were saying was true, but the interpretation uh, was not quite what I would have expected. And, you know, Salim Yusuf is a good friend. I, you know, immediately started talking to him about this. Uh, and it's, when you look at what they were really saying uh, by going into the methods, what they're saying is that uh, it's not just high carbohydrate intake, it's high refined carbohydrate intake. They were very particular in the methods to say, this is white rice, white sugar, white flour, those sorts of refined grains that we've been talking about for the last few minutes, those are associated with increased mortality. Um, and so sure, if you could replace polyunsaturated fat um, instead of your um, uh, saturated fat and get rid of uh, refined carbohydrates, you will see a 11% lower risk of mortality. That makes perfect sense. So that was not a, so it shouldn't have been a promotion of fat. It should have been uh, in impugning uh, refined grains yet again. So we do have, uh, for anyone who still has to argue this with someone, please send them to the uh, presidential advisory from a few years ago at the American Heart Association. Uh, it's very clear that the, the sum total of all the data uh, says that your saturated fat is actually bad for you. Unsaturated fat actually lowers um, your uh, dangerous cholesterol. So let's segue there in, <clears throat> into cholesterol um, because we do have a fair amount of uh, information uh, that was kind of scary. So many people are going around with uh, elevated cholesterols and uh, some of it's genetic. And you've heard a lot about that with, uh, uh, with Dr. Khan, how to, how to assess it and how to manage it. Well, the important point that people need to take away is that an elevated serum cholesterol is dangerous in part because um, it is the uh, transport protein to get into the cells for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so the more cholesterol you have, the more infective uh, the disease is going to be. And so that does uh, do a, a lot to explain the relationship between elevated cholesterol and worsened COVID outcomes. What should we be doing? Well, first of all, recognize that all the animal products have substantial amounts of uh, cholesterol and uh, with few exceptions, and the plant products do not. Uh, egg whites do not, neither does Jell-O, neither does honey, even though they're animal products. Um, but the problem with the last two is that they tend to be either sugar or artificial sugar, so they may be worse than cholesterol actually. And the problem with egg whites is that people keep eating them with egg yolks which has a massive amount of cholesterol. Hopefully nobody's eating hundred grams of egg yolks. And so can we do dietary interventions to improve cholesterol and inflammation? You certainly can. Uh, Lovastatin uh, was our original statin studied years ago. David Jenkins uh, had showed dramatic improvement uh, in um, both, uh, of both of these variables, cholesterol 
LDL cholesterol, uh, and the high sensitivity C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation. They both go down with a statin and they go down uh, with a dietary portfolio you've probably heard of, plant sterols, soy protein, viscous fibers, that's like uh, Metamucil or uh, psyllium, and almonds three times a day. And it turns out um, that the LDL reduction is about the same. Now the lipidologists among us will argue that lovastatin was fairly weak statin, 20 milligrams. That's probably like five milligrams of rosuvastatin uh, or 10 milligrams of atorvastatin, if that much. Uh, but the C-reactive protein also fell. And the C-reactive protein was actually a little faster going down with the, um, uh, with the diet. And that has to do with the microbiome that I'm gonna touch on be before we close. But it's very clear that the microbiome is one of the factors that makes uh, the plant-based diet less uh, inflammatory. And you can see when you do an intervention uh, such as the Evade CAD trial by Benita Shaw at NYU, you'll see significant falls in the um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein that you don't see when you do an American Heart Association diet that continues to have animal products. If you look at one of those wonderful uh, Neil Barnard, uh, Yokoyama uh, meta-analyses, massive amount of data. Why do, you, why do people keep studying it? Well, it's because there's so many people saying that diet doesn't matter. And you heard a great explanation about, um, you know, uh, cholesterol absorption, acetamide versus statins uh, versus diet uh, from Dr. Khan. So I won't reproduce much of that, but uh, suffice it to say that the preponderance of the evidence is that the, what people are telling you that, that diet doesn't matter just isn't the case. It is true that you can saturate that uh, Neiman picked like one enzyme in the, in the GI tract, you can saturate it. And so you get it to the point where it just can't do anymore. And so the people who are eating three eggs a day, you can give them four or five eggs a day and you won't see any change in their cholesterol. But that doesn't mean that going from three to two to one to zero isn't going to make a difference because it will. Okay. So I want to switch over um, and talk more about some of the dietary patterns that are getting us into trouble. The number one on my list, uh, and you know, we can take a vote uh, at the end of the talk to see which one you think is the, the most damaging, um, but I, I'm, I'm going to go with this one. Uh, and that is the REGARD study uh, at University of Alabama, Birmingham, reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke they actually found more than just stroke. And this is the, the curve falling, rolling down the hill, survivorship going down very quickly when you eat what's called a Southern diet. Now, none of these diets look optimal, uh, but the Southern diet uh, very quickly leads the pack in terms of heart attack, stroke and death uh, because of its content. The Southern diet, people will recognize it as soul food uh, so organ meats, um, fried foods, chicken, uh, taking yams and making them candied yams, uh, sugar sweetened beverages, uh, uh, the sweet tea in the South. Uh, these are uh, highly deleterious. You could take, grits are actually good for you, but if you take grits and you put cheese and butter in them, uh, like they do in the South, uh, when I was training at Grady uh, Hospital in Atlanta, that, that turns it from something positive into negative. And so the REGARDS trial showed very clearly that that Southern diet pattern compared to the other American diets had a 56% higher risk of heart disease, more stroke, more kidney disease, more death. The second dietary pattern that I would talk about um, or is really not just a pattern, it's an article that probably everyone should download and just take a look at. It actually tells you what is the cutoff for dying. And, and <coughs> excuse me, that we, I used to sit in the, as the American College of Cardiology president, sitting with the American Heart Association president and the World Heart Federation president, just hearing the two of them going back and arguing with the AHA saying 1800 milligrams is, is too much. And the World Heart saying, no, uh, the, the, as far down as we'll go is 2300. Uh, because the pure trial actually said that four to 5,000 milligrams was actually okay. 
Well, they were all talking about different things. Uh, that's really what the issue was. But if you want to avoid cardiovascular disease, uh, a good rule of thumb would be to avoid doing more than 2,000 milligrams per day. Not enough nuts and seeds, not enough uh, vegetables, fruits. Um, but the two things that are really striking on this, on this graph is the increase in mortality if you do high degree of processed meat and high being defined as greater than zero, meaning any, ever. Uh, and processed meat, people don't always know what that is. So I'll just say it out loud. It would be like uh, bacon, uh, jerky, um, ham, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ham, hot dogs, sausages, lunch meat. And if you're eating those things uh, with the preservatives in them, you, it actually increases the mortality and the danger. Uh, so red meat, sure, it's on the list at the bottom. And small amounts of red meat actually do increase mortality. Um, but, and that 14.3 grams, that's a, a, you know, just a, a little bit uh, of, of red meat. But that's, that's going to be safer than doing processed red meat. Uh, the other one that's a zero here, meaning don't do it ever, is, high, is uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. And so I hope people will, will recognize the danger of those because uh, we have a lot of plant-based uh, nutrition people who are doing sugar-sweetened beverages, which is a good segue into this article. The next pattern I wanna talk about is so-called plant-based diets that are healthful versus unhealthful. And you'll notice Walter Willard, Frank Hugh. So this is uh, nurses health, that's the nurses and health professional follow-up, that's the doctors. Uh, and you, you follow uh, both these sets of people for almost 30 years analyze the data, and it looks like this. If you're doing an unhealthy plant-based diet, taking the potatoes and then frying them, uh, you know, potato chips, French fries, uh, taking um, your tea and putting a lot of sugar in it, if you're, if you're uh, actually uh, doing the, the refined grains so that, you know, yes, the vegan donuts may taste good and they may you know, be good for the environment because they're vegan, but they're really not good for human health. And so they analyze this data for unhealthiness of a plant-based diet. And what you're seeing on the right here is a dashed line saying that that type of vegan diet is, is unhealthy, even compared with an animal-laden diet, that you're going to do better eating animals than you would eating an unhealthy plant-based diet. And so we end up back at the, at the PURE trial. It's, it's interesting that after me sort of you know, talking to Salim Yusuf about the fact that they really needed to come out and not just say carbohydrates, but talk about refined carbohydrates. They, so they finally published it a few months ago uh, that yes, in the PURE trial, the problem was actually um, refined grains that was increasing blood pressure, increasing cardiovascular events. And so hopefully everyone needs to uh, understand that grains are good, refined grains are not. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the controversy that came up uh, a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, Journal of Nutrition saying uh, plant-based diets uh, and their risk of cardiovascular disease, saying that there was a greater risk of ischemic stroke. Well, that was actually one study. And in, when you look at the, um, the plurality of the data, you'll see that carotid artery disease that would lead to stroke is actually substantially better. And they, this article is heavily critical of the fact that there aren't large prospective randomized high quality research on the topics. Um, but what they're saying is that <clears throat> if you look at cardiovascular disease events, you're gonna see that vegans either had neutral or a substantially lower rate, 52%. <clears throat> so uh, this data is uh, was challenging to people who do plant-based nutrition. Um, you, everyone who's a practitioner knows exactly what's going on because you see the patients get better, but the onus is on us to put the data together in a, in a scientifically presentable way, get it in the journals so that people can stop saying that vegan diets are bad for you, that cause stroke, that cause all sorts of things. Um, so there actually is good data that came out, fortunately, even after that, this is from, uh, I think about 10 days ago, 
in, in the um, neurology journal that actually came to the conclusion that no, you don't get more stroke with the plant-based diet. You actually get a, a, you get less stroke substantially. And so, um, and that would be the, the hazard ratio of um, 0.9. But notice that that is for the so-called HPDI, which you saw earlier, um, that's a healthy plant-based uh, diet. And so you, we can't lump them all together. And if you do, you get what you see in purple, no association between vegetarian diet and total stroke. And that's because you're mixing in the people who are doing a healthy and an unhealthy plant-based diet. So lower risk of stroke is going to be observed when people follow a healthful plant-based diet without the refined carbs.